Hello and welcome to this Blender and Nuke compositing tutorial. Essentially I'm going to do like a start to finish process of how to do like 3D camera tracking and then taking that camera into Blender, setting up all the render layers and stuff and then going back into Nuke and doing shader rebuilds and things and doing all the compositing. This is going to be quite a long video but I'm going to do timestamps in the description so that if you know how to do a certain thing you can jump ahead or go to a specific section that you're interested in and then hopefully that will make it a bit more digestible for people. So before we start I think it's probably important to say that this is quite an advanced tutorial. If you have a little bit of knowledge of Nuke and Blender, you can probably follow along and figure it out. But if this is like your first time opening Nuke or Blender, then this is going to be a bit over your head. So with that said, let's get started. So the first thing I did is in Nuke, I bought in my footage, obviously. And the first thing I had to do to seat the tank into the scene is do the camera track. So I'm not going to like go through how to do camera tracking and stuff in Nuke. There's plenty of tutorials out there about it. But essentially, I drew some roto for the bushes and things so that I wasn't tracking the leaves uh, because they move, so that would throw the track off. Then I plugged that into the camera tracker uh, so that they were isolated. I put in all my camera settings into the camera tracker, so like my film pack size and everything, which is the size of your sensor. I put in my uh, lens that I was using. And then this allows you to output a camera. So you do create camera, and there we go. So my camera is over here. You should normally uh, camera track undistorted footage. The correct way to do this that will give the most accurate results is to use a lens grid. And a lens grid looks like this. It's like a checkerboard sort of pattern. And you basically get the camera with the lens that you're using to shoot the scene on and just film or take a photo of it. And because of the nature of the pattern on the checkerboard, it reveals how towards the edges of the frame the lens distortion is occurring and how the light is bending as it goes into the lens. And the reason you need this is because CG doesn't have any lens distortion. So when you render it, it has perfectly straight lines going all the way from the center to the edge of the frame. There's no simulation of light refracting and bending and curving as it goes through glass like it does in a real camera. So to do that, you add a lens distortion node. The way I did it without a lens grid is I took some footage of my window in my bedroom because there's lots of straight lines. I did a frame hold on a certain frame, which just happened to be 324. Towards the end of the video clip was where I was most perpendicular to the center of the window. So that's why I did that. Then you add a lens distortion node, and if you come to the tab called line analysis, basically you can uh, enable drawing on mode, and you draw some lines by clicking, and it adds these crosses, and then you right click, and it creates a line, and you add some lines all around the scene going vertically and horizontally, and then when you're done, you press analyze, and as you can see, it ever so slightly warps the footage, and it's calculating the lens distortion. So then we can apply this to our footage, and then you plug your camera tracker into this. And now you can track the undistorted footage. And then the other thing I did is I selected the tracking points uh, on the floor and on the background. So I did like a few on the ground like this, if I can actually click. You right click and do create card. And what that does is create uh, some geometry that is basically the floor. So I did one for the background and one for the, um, one for the floor. And then I added this cube, which is the location in 3D space where the tank is going to be when I go into Blender. Plugged all of my stuff into a scene node, which means that it kind of combines all of the reference geometry and the camera. And then I wrote it out. So I used a write geo node. I set the file type to be Alembic and I changed storage format from HDF to Agawa. So then you choose where you want it to go and just press execute. And that's going to export like every frame, the position of the camera and the geometry into a file that you can then bring into Blender. So back in Blender. Uh, this is our scene currently, so let's imagine we're on a fresh scene like this, which is how I started. You go File, Import, Alembic, find where you saved the scene file, and then you end up with the geometry. I actually scaled mine slightly, so if we go into one of the side views, you can actually just select everything and just rotate it so that it's flat to the floor, and then scale it up to be the size of the scene. So I had my tank actually scaled to the correct proportions of an actual tank, so then I just scaled up the, the scene to match the size of the tank. So all I did here, this is my tank model. Uh, there's nothing fancy going on. Did a very basic rig. So this is like a wireframe of a cube on the outside and this is how I control the movement. I added a driver to um, the wheels so that when I move this backwards and forwards, the wheels turn. So it just saves me having to animate the wheels. And then uh, this circle on top controls the rotation of the turret. So if I go to my render setup in the node editor, by the way, this, if you go into the node editor, you need to go under the render layers tab, not the materials one, otherwise you won't be able to see it. I basically made a render layer for each of the four passes that I want to output. So the first one is our beauty render, and this is going to be like what the actual tank looks like, and it's got all of our light passes in it. So the four render passes are the beauty, 
the position pass, which I'll explain in a second, the utilities, which have all of our motion vectors and the UVs and normals and everything, and then the shadow, which is just an alpha channel that I can use to grade the floor uh, to create the tank shadow. So for each of these, I created a uh, render layers node and set each one to be the different render passes. And then I also created a file output node. And this controls where all of the channels go. Uh, so when you're in Nuke, you can play around with them. So the file output node by default looks like this. And then you can add, if you press N in this little menu on the side, you can tell it what all of the channels are gonna be called. So here's one of the first quirks of Blender. Nuke by default, when it's reading in an image, so like the CG here, expects the image to be called RGBA. And if it doesn't, you end up, this doesn't show anything, it will just be black. And what Blender does by default when it's naming things is it sets the overall beauty image, which is the first like RGBA image to be called combined underscore combined or something. So it's not actually called RGBA. So when you bring the render into Nuke, the frame will actually be black, which is kind of annoying. So the way to get around that is to change the image name to be RGBA with one of these file output nodes. So you set the first one to be called RGBA and then you can do add new input and you create custom inputs for all of these um, different light paths. So for example, the ambient occlusion, I've called the AO, and then you just plug the ambient occlusion output from the render layers into the file output node, like that, and you do that for each of those. So that's the beauty. Then we have the shadow. This is just the one because it's literally just an alpha channel, so I only needed the one layer. And then we have our position pass. What a position pass is, if I show you very quickly, I'll just turn off all of these and hit render. It's like a gradient that goes across the whole scene, so there's going to be color information for every pixel, essentially. And this allows you to go in and like color pick a certain area, and then you can create an alpha channel and grade a certain area of the frame. So I graded the tank once it fires, I did like a sort of glow of the explosion on the tank, and I used the position pass to do that, which I'll show later on. The way to make a position pass, there's not a built-in way of doing it in Blender, but you can do it by creating a global shader that you apply to everything. So if I just add a cube that we can just add the texture to for now. So let's apply the position uh, shader to this so we can see what it looks like. It's essentially a geometry node, and then the position of that gets plugged into a separate RGB node. Because Blender's X, Y, and Z axes are kind of different to other programs, like I think Nuke Y is up instead of Z in Blender, you have to uh, switch the channels to be other way around. So red goes into the blue channel, green goes into the red channel, and blue goes into the green channel. And then the image output of that goes into an emission node, and what this does is it makes it a shadeless color. So the emission is just like a light basically, and it's just set to a value of one. And this just means that the position pass isn't gonna have any shadows or anything on it. It's gonna be completely shadeless. It's just gonna be the color information. That goes into a mix shader, and the factor of the mix shader is controlled by a light path node. And you just use is camera ray, plug that into the factor, and then the shader output of here goes into the material output. I don't really understand it enough to explain exactly how it works, but that's how you make a position pass. So feel free to like take a screenshot or something of this. That's how you do it. So I just called this uh, the position material and then under the um, render layers tab for the position pass, I've just set the material. This is like a global material that's applied to everything in your scene. I've set it to be the position material. And so that means when I render it, you end up with this. In the other ones, I don't have anything on, but in the position pass, I'm applying a position material. Another thing to note is I have all of my like objects and stuff on different render layers. Um, so layer one is the tank and the camera. Layer two is the light, layer three is the rig, layer five is the floor, and then layer, uh, I think this is like layer 10, is a shadow catcher. Um, so for the position pass to work, you have to have all of them enabled. And then you actually choose which layers you want to uh, specifically render under the layers selection tab. It's kind of hard to get your head around, but essentially the beauty layer, so we only want to render the tank. So you only set this to be the tank layer and the light layer. So that's one and two. So I select one and two here. This one isn't uh, what actually gets rendered. This is just what you're currently viewing. So this is, doesn't control the render output at all. This controls what's being rendered. For the position pass, you want to render everything because you want the um, position for every bit of geometry that's in the scene. So I'm rendering everything except for the shadow catcher because shadow catchers don't have a material, so you can't actually see it. And in fact, if I actually turn the shadow catcher on, it breaks the position pass because it's like clipping through the floor geometry that I have. So I've turned that off and I'm just rendering the top five, which is like the tank and the lights and the floor. And then the utilities are the same, so I'm rendering everything except for the shadow catcher again, because you want the vectors and everything for all of your geometry. And then the shadow, uh, I'm only rendering the shadow catcher. So you end up with just a shadow on an alpha channel, basically. 
So in the file output node, you have to set the location of the render to be a specific folder. So I set a beauty folder, a position pass, a shadow, and a utility folder. So then when you hit render animation, it's gonna render all of those frames and put them into the specific folders automatically. So before, what I used to do was just render like just the beauty pass and then make a new folder and then just render the shadow pass. So I'd have to be at my computer to like set off the new renders. This is good if you're gonna like render something overnight because it will just render them all and it will put them into the folders for you. So I think that's pretty much everything in Blender. So now let's jump back into Nuke and go through the compositing. So in Nuke, we have our footage. And then uh, first of all, I think we'll talk about the shader rebuild because this is the most complicated part. So this is what our raw render looks like out of Blender. This is all of those light paths combined into like a beauty image basically. Uh, and it looks fine, like you can, you can literally just merge this over the background if you wanted to. So I just do this. There you go, like we've got a tank in the scene, but you can see it's like super dark and it's much sharper than the uh, background and there's no shadow and stuff. And I've actually built a custom tool for this that I'm gonna put a link to in the description if you guys wanna download it so you don't have to make this all yourself. I've called it a Blender Comp setup and it's essentially a group of nodes. And if we go inside here, this is how the shader rebuilding works in Blender. So this is where like the basic understanding of Nuke kind of comes in because you kind of need to go know what's going on, but I'm gonna try and explain it so it's less complicated if I can. Basically, we have the direct, indirect, and the color in four groups. So we have a diffuse, which is like a flat color, glossy, which is reflections, transmission, which is like glass and see-through materials, and subsurface, which is like skin. So you know how like you get a torch and you shine it through your finger and you can see like the red and you can see your bones and stuff sometimes if the light's really intense, that's subsurface. For this, I didn't actually use, as you can see, I only used diffuse and glossy because I didn't have any subsurface or transmission textures in my render. So essentially what's happening, all these individual passes get shuffled out into separate shuffle nodes. So we're just grading that one light pass as opposed to all of them at once. So we have the glossy direct, which is like the direct lighting from the sun in the reflections pass. Then we have the indirect, which is like bounce lights where the sun hits the road and then bounces back up on the tank. Again, just for the reflections. And then the glossy color. And then what happens is when you, ever you do any grading to individual passes in Nuke, you want to unpremolt them and then premolt them afterwards, which means you don't end up messing with the edges. So say you graded it to be really, really bright, you might end up accidentally expanding the alpha. So this just means that uh, you like expand the edge slightly, do all the grading and then shrink it back down at the end. So the way to rebuild stuff from a, from Cycle's render engine is slightly different to like Arnold or Mantra. You basically have to plus the direct and the indirect passes together and then multiply the color on top. The reason why the color is a multiply and the other two are a plus is because these two are actual like color lighting information. So they get plus together to combine to be like an overall lighting shader. And then the color itself isn't actually lighting information. It's like a it controls how much of the color comes through. So in this case, the glossy color is pure white because the only color information is coming from the glossy pass because it's a metal tank. So it's all like reflective textures. There's no like skin textures or anything in this. So basically in Nuke, black has a value of zero and white has a value of one and anything in between is like a decimal. So like middle gray would be 0.5. So this is saying, take this color information and multiply it by a value of one because the tank color is pure white. And that means it's outputting 100% of the glossy shader. If there was a bit of a diffuse texture in it as well, so we had some glossy and some diffuse, this would be a more of a gray color and there'd be some gray color coming from the diffuse color as well. So this would be multiplied by maybe like 0.7 which would mean that 70% of the two passes that get plus together here would be coming through. And then this would have a value of 0.3. So it might end up looking something a bit more like this. And you have to do that for each of these. So it's the same, the diffuse direct and the diffuse indirect get plus together and then multiply the diffuse color. The whole glossy category gets plus on top of the diffuse and then the transmission gets plus on top and the subsurface, etc. down the side. We also have the emission pass, which I plussed on at the end. This is just the lights. And then right at the end, we're copying the alpha from the original image up here into the bottom. And again, this is because just in case we've broken the alpha with any of the grading, it's putting the original one in at the end. So here I've just done a little bit of grading to some of the passes just to make the tank fit into the environment a bit better. Then for the emission pass, I've added an exponential glow and then just did a bit of grading on them as well. And then that's pretty much the shader rebuild. And then you start doing uh, your stuff like motion blur and things after that. So this is my utilities pass here. And this is the position pass. I'll explain about the lens distortion stuff in a minute. So just ignore that for now. But essentially what I did here is copy the position pass into the utilities. So I have the position and the utilities just in this one stream of nodes that I can just use how I want. And it's just a bit more convenient. I've added a shuffle node here and I created a new channel called P because originally the position pass was in the RGB channel 
And the problem with copying that into the utilities is that the utilities already has an RGBA and I don't want to overwrite that. So I made a new channel called P and shuffled the position pass into it. So shuffle the RGBA, which has the position pass into a new channel called P, if that makes sense. Uh, then I used a copy node and just copied the P layer from the position pass into my utilities. So now you can see as well as the other utilities, I also have the P pass in that particular stream. So then I can do things down here like so. So this is my main CG stream coming in here and then I have my vectors. So I'm copying the vectors from the utility into my main stream and this is the motion blur information. So if I go back here, the way vectors work is it assigns uh, certain colors to the geometry depending on how much it's moving and then Nuke can look at that and say right this is the certain color so it needs to be motion blurred this amount. So one of the other quirks about Blender is that sometimes its motion vectors don't work properly or they're going in the wrong direction. So for example if I turn off uh, this shuffle node that I've done here you can see the direction of the motion blur will actually change to up instead of horizontal. I don't know why this is but yeah, I guess Blender's just a bit quirky compared to other software. So what you have to do if you have this problem, sometimes it's fine, sometimes it's not. If it is a problem, uh, add a shuffle node. By default, the shuffle node will look like this. Uh, that's just how shuffle nodes are automatically in Nuke. Just shuffle the alpha into the red channel and the red channel into the green channel and then leave the rest as they are. And that, as you can see, fixes the direction of the motion blur. So it's really simple, but it's one of those things that you need to know, otherwise the motion vectors don't work. Then I added a slight defocus just because the CG comes out absolutely perfect. So if I turn these off, you can see that it's really, really sharp compared to the background, like the, the wall here, the texture and stuff. The tank is by far the sharpest thing in the scene. So I added a slight defocus of just like 0.1, I think it was. And all that does is just take out some of that sharpness and just makes it a little bit blurrier. And then it kind of sits into the scene a bit better. This stuff down here is just the uh, explosion and the smoke effect that I added at the end when the tank is firing. I use the position pass to grade some highlights on the tank from the light of the explosion and also on the floor. The way this works is you have to get a uh, node called a PMAT node. This is on Nukepedia. So you plug it into your position pass and then what you can do is use this color picker and select somewhere on the screen. So you can hold control and then click and then basically I clicked the end of the turret and it gives you this alpha channel which you can expand the proximity of and then it just allows you to grade a certain area of the frame. And then I use that to add this highlight onto the front of the tank. So I was literally just grading that section instead of grading the whole thing. So it's really, really handy. And then I did the same with the plate. So uh, as you can see, there was also like an alpha channel on the geometry of the floor, which is down here. Uh, so I use that to grade the plate as well, which you can see there. Another cool thing you can do with the position pass is do a position to points node. And you can use, so you, you plug in the source, which is our CG up at the top the position pass which is obviously this and then our normals pass which i've shuffled out here so this is the normals pass and you plug that as the third input of the node and then this gives you a point cloud in 3d space of the tank so one of the things i was going to do was put the smoke element and the explosion in 3d space on cards in front of it but there just wasn't any need to but that's the kind of thing you'd use it for so going back to the lens distortion really quickly i've added a lens distortion node right at the end of my stream for the cg uh, and i've also added one for my uh, shadow pass because you want to obviously distort all of the CG. So it's really, really subtle and you'll probably barely be able to notice it, but basically uh, we use the same node as up here. So I copy and pasted this one, brought it down and plugged it in at the end of my stream. But the difference is for this one, you want to untick, undistort. So the one at the top has undistort ticked because it's undistorting the footage and getting rid of all the curving. Now we're trying to reapply the lens distortion. So if you turn off undistort, it's going to distort the CG and reapply the lens distortion that we calculated. So it's more visible to when stuff's towards the edge of the frame because that's where most of the distortion occurs. So if I toggle this on and off, you can see it's doing a bit of stretching and warping. And yeah, this is literally just reapplying the lens distortion. So there we go. That's the end of the tutorial. That's the whole process pretty much of compositing Blender renders into Nuke. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Uh, I respond to all of the comments on my YouTube channel. So if anyone gets stuck, I will do my best to help them out.